You going to tell me to push the button again or? No. Okay. Hi, Adam. It's me, Ryan. You're one listener. Oh, that's good. Okay, I'm going to call you back in a minute. From KOYR Studios in Minneapolis, Minnesota, it's Arcade Radio. Hello, Commander. Computer reporting. Intruder alert. Intruder alert. Welcome to episode three of the Arcade Radio Podcast. Today is Wednesday, November 23rd, the day before the Thanksgiving, 2016, and it's now 8.15 p.m. Central, which is when we're supposed to start. Thanks for joining us in the Arcadosphere, and um, this is your host, uh, Spice K, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined by the legendary Dan Reed and our guest host, Brian McLeod Armitage the third. Well, he's not actually the third, but I just thought I'd throw that in there because it sounds anime and stuff. You know what I mean? So welcome, guys. Um, welcome to the show, Brian. So, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's good to have you on the show. So, uh, like we like to normally kick off with, let's talk about what we're each doing in the hobby right now. Dan, why don't you lead us off? Are you doing anything new? Did you get that journey thing put together yet? What are you working on? Mm, no. As a matter of fact, I have Brian Armitage, since we have him here. I think uh, it would be a good time to talk about that. Oh, what oh, the heck what was, was that? that? Sounds like a medical pager. Mm. That is a medical pager. Uh-oh. Jeepers creepers. Everything all, I know. All good. One minute in. That's that's life. That's not no. good. Do you have to go now? No, I can oh. stick around for a minute, but I will uh, probably pause during uh, some updated arcade news oh, and, and crap. a quick phone call. That means Dan and I are going to have to like improvise. Okay. So anyway, uh, well, very quickly then, Dan, what are you working on? Dragon's Lair. Trying hmm. to do that stupid update that uh, Sean sent out. That uh, Sean. Yeah, Sean, not John. Sean, he has he has that Dexter Merlin combination. Oh, that and, dude! We talked about that. Yeah, but you, and it doesn't maybe work. for um, layman's, we should explain what that thing is. Well, it's a laser disc replacement. Okay, that plugs into a board that he makes. Okay, um, that has multiple. ROMs on it, so that way you could... Ah, yes. We talked about that on the first episode, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So the problem is I'm trying to get that thing to communicate with the... What is it? The Dexter. Okay. And in order to do so, he sends you this ROM, right? You're thinking, okay, how hard could this be? Pull off a... Pull off a... uh, You know, an IC, replace it, hook it up, bada bing, bada boom. Hell no. It's like a seven-page document. (laughs) I can't read seven pages. I know. I was like, what the hell is this? So, Brian, uh, very briefly, what are you working on? Well, I think I'm going to wait for Dan to figure that one out because I have one of those sitting on the shelf also. But <laughs> Everybody yeah, wants the, their Laserdisc games to work for some reason. Yeah, it's uh, between the collection of MCR vectors and Laserdisc games that I seem to have acquired. It's, uh, it's a never-ending project. The, the latest thing we pulled up front is I actually pulled my tax scan out. And I'm uh, trying to create one Sega cabinet instead of two Sega cabinets and uh, get the tax scan up and going, oh. which would be a lot of fun. Well, let's Sweet. talk about tax scan for just a second. Tell us what tax scan is. So tax scan is a, a really kind of fun vector game. Uh, it's a vertical shooter. 
that was done with the exploding uh, Geo 8 monitor. Oh, and, uh, yeah. So tech scan the, is the, in line with like Space Fury and Star Trek from Sega, right? Right. And uh, the fun thing about tax scan and what it is really cool about it is it's a vertical shooter when you're when you're just kind of uh, at the beginning of the game. And then at a certain point, uh, and it's all vector based, color vector, it, you basically fly into the screen and the attack, instead of going vertically on the sh- screen, you're now flying into the screen. And uh, the graphics are are pretty amazing for what they, they were able to do with with how this all laid out. Uh, instead of having lives, you kind of have seven ships, I think it is, starting at the beginning of the game at the bottom of the screen. And as you lose ships, you have less firepower. And then as you're flying along, you can pick up ships as you go. You have a tech um, scan and you're trying to get I, it working. Exactly. Ah. I love it. Trying to get it going. Trying to figure out how to make it work. So you have the Struggling cabinet. with G08 monitors. And it works <laughs> Brian, pretty good. Uh, you know, of, of all the time I've known you, I've never even asked you this. What is your Grail game? My... <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. Um, I kind of have my – the game I always wanted was the Cockpit Spy Hunter, and I've got it. Oh, yeah, that thing is sweet. Did you get that from, so, say, Chris Coolis or – No. <laughs> the Cockpit Spy Hunter is actually – the it's the second one I've had. The first one I drove to Georgia to pick up, and mm-hmm. I – Bought a uh, board from Gary, famous Gary up here, oh, a Rastan yeah. board. Nice. And I treated a Rastan board for a full cockpit spy hunter, but I had to drive to Georgia <laughs> to pick it up. Wow. That's a really good uh, deal. What the hell? You can pick up a Rastan board for like 30 bucks. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> well you don't normally have part, to drive to Georgia. <laughs> and when I showed up at 2 in the morning, this guy's house like unloaded with like 10 guys. And he's like, you owe me 10 bucks. You owe me 5 bucks. And nobody <laughs> believed some person would drive from Minnesota to pick up a spy hunter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is That's a cool really story. cool. That's really cool. So, but my dad overflowed his pool, flooded the basement, and destroyed that one. Wow. Oh, yeah. So then uh, the second one actually came from uh, John Yates down okay. in Illinois. Excellent. So, it was, so uh, you're working on a tax scan right now. That's the personal project. The, the fun project for uh, other things actually has to do with the Spy Hunter, and that's uh, we're getting closer every day to finishing off the vacuum mold for the Spy Hunter cockpit seats. Oh, oh that is so cool, dude. So, so tell me about yeah. that. Well, so the original seats were done in ABS plastic, and they're they're all broken. I think one of the funnier or sadder stories was, uh, I think it was uh, one of the guys on uh, KLV was doing a re- restore, bought a new one from somebody, a new old stock one, put it in the machine, sat down on it the first time, and it cracked. Oh. Um, you know, That's ABS cool. is, is pretty weak plastic. Well, not weak, but it, it can be fairly brittle, especially if it's old. So we pieced together the seat from a couple of different <laughs> fragments. And um, instead of doing it in ABS, we had it done in a textured polyethylene. Wow. Okay. So I, I got the first prototype in the shop. And I'm not a small guy. I literally was jumping up and down on it, uh, had it on the <laughs> floor, and I, I couldn't break it. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's amazing. So you know, if so, somebody wanted one of those, how would they contact you about getting one of those things? Or what, what's the plan on selling those things in the near future? Yeah, they're actually on the website now. Um, Ooh, we wait, shipping... wait, wait. You have a website? <laughs> I do. <laughs> What's the name of your I, I website? Have... I have to look that up. Hold on. <laughs> it's uh, paradisearcadeshop.com. Paradisearcadeshop.com. Got it. All right. So, and we've, uh, we, we have the, if you search on there for Spy Hunter Seat, it'll, it'll pop up and we're, Hoping they'll be shipping by Christmas. We've had a few setbacks with uh, as all these kind of fun projects seem to have. <laughs> They're supposed to start shipping in July, and um, well, we're we're a few months behind. But I've seen more progress in the last five weeks than I've seen the rest of the time. So I'm pretty encouraged right now. Well, that's good. So it's a vacuum mold type thing, and are you having it made overseas? And they're shipping a hundred to you, kind of thing, or how how does that look? I mean, how would you? I don't even know where to begin. Where would you go to get that made? Coon Rapids. <laughs> no, so no far way. away. <laughs> yep. Yep. We actually, so we're moving a lot more of our production uh, over here, especially for vacuum molding, sheet metal, and those things. We're finding some really good U.S.-based vendors uh, to do that stuff. Uh, oh. One of the advantages of having the business 
grow as much as it has in the last couple of years is that we're able to go out to people who we weren't able to touch before with volume and uh, make deals with them and talk to them about really getting some good pricing on things. So no, we're, the spy hunter seats are done literally half hour from the shop. Dude, oh, that's that's great. Which is awesome. That's really, yeah, no, really it's, good. It's great. Well, that we totally, we totally already went into the interview process here. We're like lit, you know, Brian, you're telling us all. So I heard your beeper go off. Do you need, do you need some time or what's going on here? Yeah. Give me, give me a minute. I'm going to just mute my uh, mic for about two minutes and then I'll be right back on. Well, maybe what we'll do is we'll just jump into the arcade news. And when you get back, no, 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 you haven't even had, uh, I think the past two times you haven't even been talking about what you've been doing lately, Pally. Why don't what? you tell us, Adam, oh, what you're currently working God, on. Somebody's going to act. All right. So I do have something to talk about. Go ahead and do your thing, Brian, and I'll just blabber on for a, a few minutes. So uh, what I've been working on um, recently is my Tapper. Uh, I have a Tapper. Uh, well, I, I bought a Tapper cocktail from Chris Coolis some time ago, and it was missing a top. So I did a, a bunch of work with my buddy, and we actually um, constructed a top for it because it didn't even have a top. And so one of the pieces that was missing it was topless it was topless and one of the pieces that was missing was the glass so i thought okay i worked with this company called e-glass service in minneapolis recently on some other pieces uh for my apb and they did a really great job and um they also do like like if you want to have um tempered or, or pencil edge which in this case, are important for the Tapper cocktail. Uh, you can have it done there. So um, about five months ago, I went to them and said, I need, uh, these are the dimensions, blah, blah, blah. And Wait, I, wait, wait, wait. Five hmm. months? Yeah. So that's where the story gets interesting or boring, depending how you're thinking, you know, how you're feeling right now. And so... Um, basically I was like, okay, I need glass for my tap or cocktail. Here's the dimensions. Can you do it? They're like, yes. And so, uh, I'm, I'm like, I, d- I don't want the little tempered stamp on it. I don't, I, d- I just want to, and I want a penciled edge. So it looks really professional. And they're like, cool, we can do that. So, um, you know, they said, we'll have it free in two weeks. So like a month goes by and I call them up and they're like, yeah, we had a problem with our vendor. They don't do that anymore, so uh, we're gonna have to send it to somebody else. So, um, long story short, five months later, and two times they had to they had to create these pieces of glass. Two times. Uh, yesterday, I got a call saying they were finally finished. Oh my god! Yeah, five months. That's it's ridiculous. terrible. Uh, which is really ter- you know, which is really awful for collectors because I was really like, hey everybody, this is a really great glass company. If you need any glass done, you should go here. But now I can't really send them anybody there because uh, they can't get it done in a timely fashion. So, but- yeah, you know what though? Let's be honest. This hobby is you're just not going to get anything done in a timely fashion in this yeah. hobby. Anyone that's 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 what's hilarious to me. Like everyone that's new and breaking into this hobby, they're like, oh, I'm gonna do this and this and this and I'll have it done in like three weeks. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. So I'm really excited. Well, also during that time we got a puppy and she decided to chew the, the AC cord end off of the, <laughs> <laughs> off of the game. So now I have to put a new one of those on, but uh, you know, Home Depot, nine bucks. Ain't Not no even. Thing. It's like, it's like $3 for the piece. You know, I just haven't okay. done it yet. So, but yeah, you're right. So tomorrow, um, they are delivering the glass for free because I ordered three pieces, one for my, um, tapper cocktail and one for my gapless cocktail, which is the same dimensions. Um, because those midway cabinets were different than the classic Galaga and Pac-Man, um, midway cabinets that you're used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, they came later in the game. Uh, actually, in the same form factor, Journey. So, um, but yeah, so I have three pieces of glass coming. Um, okay. One one will complete my tapper, um, and I have a Phoenix uh, reproduction underlay, which Phoenix Arcade 
um, does a wonderful tapper cocktail underlay, which by the way is going away. He's never making it again. There's no demand for it. So, (laughs) (laughs) which is, there is a demand for tapper, but the tapper cocktails are so rare. You just, just, just no demand for the, the underlay. So, yeah. So those are going away. So I um I have that in and and, and and um I've gone through the whole machine. Uh it has original uh Geo seven in it, Electro Home. Um, uh, but I'm probably gonna replace that with a, a more modern Wells Gardner replacement. Um so that's what I'm working on. So tomorrow I should have a working tapper cocktail again. Wow, that's cool. I am, I am back. Hey Sorry for Brian break. Welcome back to the show. Did you save any lives? <laughs> the, the world is a better place now. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so that's probably the first time I've shared on the show. So thanks, Dan, for calling calling me out on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I usually interview everybody else first. Hey, uh, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then we just jump right into the interview. But I think now what we need is a little... I don't know, Arcade News. It's the Arcade News with Don Reed! <laughs> That's your cue, Dan. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> uh, well, let's take a look here. The West End St. Louis Park... What, a, what is that? That's West, West End, End St. Louis Park. Yeah, they have a shopping center area. Yeah, they have a new arcade. So how bizarre is that? These things are starting to crop up everywhere. They're getting more and more popular. So I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. Uh, rumor has it you went there. Yeah. And, so uh, uh, I'll be your field reporter this week. Oh, very good, very good. I actually finally went to Up Down. So got to see that place. Really awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, spent a lot of money on um, a bunch of different arcade games and beer and uh, decided I will never eat the food there again. But um, luckily, it's an uptown surrounded by like Emoto and all these really awesome places. So you can have Japanese, or you can have American, you can have, go over to Brand Lake Bowl, you can have. So there's all kinds of places to eat. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Really, really, really cool. A good mix, uh, like a uh, awesome, awesome um, mix of old games, uh, classic games, as it were, and some modern games as well. And then, as far as um, the Punchbowl Social goes, I happen to go there as well. And the arcade that's, that's the one in St. Louis Park, right? Yeah, yeah. And that thing is tiny. It has like two ski balls, a Miss Pac Man, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a mu- and then like a smattering of other games. It's super small, but it does have lawn bowling and real bowling, and okay. three bars, craft cocktails, and craft beers. So while it doesn't have a giant arcade, I would say go because super super fun atmosphere and just really good um, cocktails and people that are really really willing to serve you drinks. So, Brian, what are your thoughts on barcades and kind of this new uprising of the arcade again? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's got some really great things, uh, really great points, and some really interesting effects on the market. One of the things I think that uh, people are noticing is that the price of games are going up well, significantly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And some of that, I think, is just due to popularity, which is driven by people talking about it. And these barcades and people going and playing them, some of it's due to them becoming older and rare and harder to find nice quality ones. But I, I know uh, we're involved with helping out uh, some of the barcades and some of the different places, sourcing machines and getting in on collections that they can purchase. And I, they're just, you know, they go out and purchase 100 machines like it's, you know, oh, it's Saturday. Let's go buy 100 machines. Yeah. Uh, and so we're starting to see, I think, the effects of that on the in the collector market because, you know, the stashes of these machines are starting to disappear as these barcades go out and just purchase enormous numbers of them. Those barn finds that used to get bought by a couple of guys and sold off to the community are now bought by a barcade and basically kept by the barcade. Yeah. So I I think what what we're seeing is we're seeing a change in kind of how, how things play out. Uh, As far as the, The rest of it, the thing that I think is great is, you know, a lot of them are really trying to 
maintain the character, the nature of the machines. Um, I know Updown is very passionate about CRTs instead of LCDs. Mm-hmm. Um, so am I. They're, they're really trying to do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you go into to, uh, Updown and it's it's a pretty good vibe. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of hipsters and I don't know beer, but I mean that seems to be the model that has had the most success. You know, for uh, sustaining an arcade. So. I would I would interject that. There were things I didn't like about Up Down. Like, really? Yeah. Like, uh, there were a number of games that just like half the coin mechs weren't working, or like they don't use the original hardware, or they're using some sort of emulator inside the game, which is like uh, Moon Patrol, for example, had some weird boot up screen and, um, you know, Dig Dug wasn't balanced. There were just like little nitpicky things. But overall, I don't really care about that stuff. It's like, okay, this is a place where I can come in and play games. And I can play the games that I liked as a kid. And I get to play a few new games that I've never tried. And some games that I may have never, never seen in my arcade as a kid. So it's a good environment um, overall. So yeah, there's like little nitpicky things, but they don't, they don't necessarily dissuade me from wanting to play any of the games. Yeah, and you know, honestly, you can't get crazy about that kind of stuff. I mean, we're when you collect and when you restore, yeah, that's one thing, and it's a whole other thing to run a barcade. So, you know, I'm more willing to cut these guys a lot of slack if they're going to throw in a half joystick, you know, in a in a venture or something. I I don't really care. It's more about people coming in and sort of getting. Uh, reinvigorated about this hobby. So I don't know if it's drawing more attention to um, collectors and I don't I can't tell if it's helping or hurting the, the hobby. Oh yeah. I, I think it's helping. I mean, a lot of people get upset about the price of machines going up, but the reality is, is, you know, when I look at that from the collector perspective, uh, you know, all of a sudden I got to pay how much for something that cost $200, you know, six years ago. But on the flip side of that, um, as a business, there's more opportunities to do things and it makes more sense to do it, which then as a collector makes me happy because, you know, if, if the machine's only worth 200, if, if a cockpit spy hunter is only worth 400 bucks, why would you spend $250 to put a seat in it? Right. You know, but once the machine prices go up, it becomes worth doing these different ventures. Uh, things like the cassette player, uh, the MP3 adapter that you did, Dan. I mean, all of these things become valuable commodities that are worth doing for the collectors and for the people who are interested in trying to recreate uh, those original machines. There's now more ability to do that because the machines themselves cost more. Yeah. So I think overall it's a good thing. I think it's hard because even, I mean, it is difficult to see stuff where you go, gosh, you know, six years ago I sold two of these for, you know, 300 bucks and now people are paying $1,200 for this. You know what? <laughs> I think that's a yeah. good thing. I, I, you know, a, a lot of us collectors are complaining about prices going up and I don't really care. In fact, I like it, you know, because I have a pile of games that one day I will want to sell or maybe want to trade and they have more value now. Yeah, but you know, honestly, here's a goofy thing. Like, let's talk rare games. Okay. Let's talk Paperboy. All right. right. Paperboy has been a fifteen hundred to what mint condition two thousand dollar game. Seems a little high to me. While, yeah. Right. Well, no, I mean that's pretty much what they've been at least around here. Sure. Yeah. Pac Man has been a three hundred dollar game, which is dumb because that game deserves more than. Well, either way. It, Ultimately, you go on Craigslist right now. Pac Man's an eight hundred dollar game. Yeah, which what? you're probably not going to get eight hundred bucks for it. But Paperboy is still I don't a know fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar game. I fully expect if if the Pac Man's in good condition, I would pay eight hundred bucks. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I know, and the, and the, and I think that's okay. Yeah, I mean it's fine. That's that's where we are right now. But yeah. I I think it's, this isn't really about all games going up. I think the cheap games have kind of raised i think the floor has been raised a little bit and that's yeah. pretty much what everyone's complaining and i think about. this like, is like you're not gonna be buying a nibbler for 200 bucks this anymore. is totally a, a price police thing right and and it, we argue about this 
all the time in forums and everywhere else, but basically it's the value that somebody wants to pay for the game. And right now the values are up and I think that's a great thing. Yep. I, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about it for me is that I actually think what's happening is the, you still find the low hanging fruit sometimes it's just, there's so many people running after it. Yeah. It's hard to get it. I mean, we just bought in the last two months, I bought six games all for under 300 bucks a piece. Oh wow! You know, Craigslist finds that you just jump on quickly. But the, the thing those are more is, rare is I, now, don't you think? It, well, I think they come up, but they just disappear so quickly. Yeah. Right. I mean, all of those we got within 15 minutes of the post. Yeah. Whereas eight years ago, if you got back to the guy the first day, you were pretty much going to get the machine. Yeah. The thing that kills me now, or are, are, well, and then so building on that, I'll finish that thought. I think what's actually going up in price are the high end machines that are restored or preserved. And I, and that's where I think what we're going to see as time goes on is I think we're going to see a bubble somewhat of the middle of the road machines that are in okay condition. I think they're going to, I think they're either at their peak or they're going to hit close to their peak soon, Mm -hmm. but the rare machines or the machines that are in excellent preserved condition or restored. I think there's always going to be a market of people who are willing to pay more to get something that looks better. Right. Yeah. And so that's kind of interesting. I, I, that's where I think things are going to get fun over the next, you know, 10 to 15 years, finding that mint condition, you know, looking perfect journey. I think those are going to continue to rise in price slowly, but rise. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the beat up cabinet that you may never be able to restore, I think those are going to start to level off and then come down. And, you know, I, I'm going to throw this out there because this is my huge pet peeve. Uh, when somebody sells me a game, 99% of the time, I don't want them to have touched it. Mm. Like if they say I restored a Donkey Kong, I instantly <laughs> don't cringe. want the game. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I'm thinking, okay, restored to somebody else is I grabbed a roller. Oh, no. And some paint and attacked this thing. That was me. I'm yeah. really sorry. It was so me. if you see a little <laughs> like orange peel, whatever, if this <laughs> thing isn't done perfectly, don't restore the thing. Leave yeah. it the alone. Yeah. You know, just, just leave it alone. And for me, I, I, when, when I restored my Donkey Kong and just as an aside here, sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, I did roller mine, but that was one of my earlier restores. And the other thing is, is it ended up, you know, getting signed by Steve Wiebe, which for me is like, okay, cool. Like that's just, uh, it's my machine, right? It's mine. And I wanted him to sign it. So, yeah. uh, it ain't perfect, but it is a really cool machine. When people come over, I can tell a story and I, I love it, you know? So, yeah, yeah. but I, I totally get what you're saying. Like somebody says, uh, fully restored. What does that mean? You know, and if you right. open it up, does it have like a JAMA kit in it or, you know, what do they do to the thing, you know, to quote unquote restore it. Right. And that to me almost devalues a machine. I'd rather have sure. a hacked up, beat up defender that I can bring back to life. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Yeah. What about you, Brian? I, you know, I, I spend so much time running around working on projects that I've gotten to the point where I don't, I, I, I like the nice machines. I like them restored, but the most important thing to me is being, having them be playable. Yeah. And so I kept buying machines that were projects. Oh, you get this great deal for 150 bucks. You just have to get it working. And I think in the last five months, I've just stopped buying those. And I buy stuff that is working that I would play. You know, the condition of the cabinet or how it looks is questionable. But most of the stuff I'm picking up now is stuff that I can bring it home, plug it in, and do something with it without having to work on it. Because I've got a ridiculous number of projects in the queue that, you know, some of them I'll probably never get to. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. So let's continue on with the news, uh, Dan Reed. Well, let's take a look here. Hollywood has reported that there will be a Mortal Kombat reboot. So the film franchise um, is getting a reboot, and they've named a director. Well, that that's great. You uh, are you a fan of the Mortal Kombat? You know, it's funny. I really enjoyed the original. 90s Mortal Kombat movie and I love Mortal Kombat. I love the Sega game and everything. 
Uh, and remember, I don't know if you guys remember the blood code for the Sega Genesis to unlock real blood in the game. But um, I, 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 I thought the first movie was fun. And um, it was a blatant ripoff of Enter the Dragon. Um, so I'm interested to see what a new movie might do. Um, but if it's along the lines of like doom, I don't care, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, has there been a good video game movie? And I don't know. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Honestly, eh, they've all been sort of meh. I mean, even Tron, Tron 2 right? So Tron was like, okay. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm hey. alone in that. No, I, I, I kind of like Tron 2. I don't know. Everyone hates it, but I saw it in the theater, and I thought it was pretty darn uh, pretty darn good. Yeah. It's not terrible. No. It's had some good moments. Delivered so expectations. Dire- yeah. <laughs> so director is Simon McQuad, who I've never heard of before. Right, yeah. He Apparently only he's done. has uh, one credit on IMDb, and that is... Mortal Kombat. <laughs> so I'm not really sure how. <laughs> but apparently how this he's is done like go. commercials or something. So, uh-huh. like critically acclaimed commercials. Yep. It's kind of like uh, kind of like when Highlander came out, right? That director had only done music videos up until that point. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. So, there can be only one. Yeah. Oh, there can be only oh, one. Brian McLeod of the Clan McLeod. <laughs> I knew I was going to be able to tie that in at some point. (laughs) So Chicago got itself a, what appears to be some sort of restaurant style arcade called the replay beer and bourbon. Yeah. Um, And it replaced something that was there before it. Do you have anything? Was that in in the site of uh, another was that another arcade at one point or yeah, it was a, it was another, it was a rebranded space. Um, Oh, I don't know what it's called. The headquarters Lakeview as arcade bar re- rebrands after a lawsuit. So apparently there was Oops. like an arcade there that didn't do very well. Like a barcade. Oh, that, that I think is tokens and tankards. No, that could oh. be, and they. Oh yeah, so it's really not a new one. They're just rebranding. Yeah, but they? it's a new oh, owner. Goodness. And I, I loved mm. tokens and tankards. That was a great name. Yeah. So, so I'm sad that that went away. Trouble. But have you been there, Brian? Uh, I've been to tokens and tankards. The guy that opened it up is a great guy. Um, neat building. It was kind of this. It had this uh, kind of medieval theme to it. So okay. if that's oh, the weird. that's the space, it's awesome. It's a really nice space. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, classic gaming, or is this all redemption stuff? Well, this well, says... no, it was all it was all classic. The stuff that he had. Yeah. Um, that was the okay. fun part about it. I mean, you kind of had this, you know, uh, 13th century meets classic arcades feel in there. It was a uh, an interesting thing. There was they had card games and other things. So. It'll be interesting to see if that's the same space. It kind of the big wooden door got that traditional pub feel to it. So it's gonna be a lot of fun if they were able to open that up again. I know there was um a lot of issues there <laughs> to say the I least. I wish uh, Chicago I wish Chicago would spread the love a little bit with these things. They could uh send them west, please. Thank you. Well they have they have a huge uh if you just look on Google Maps uh for arcade, you'll see like a huge um there's like at least two or three arcades, uh, and then Namco has a presence there, and it's like the only Namco Bandai official um, presence in the United States, uh, and they they still have a, a headquarters there in Illinois, which is really near all those other shops. So it's really interesting, actually, um, uh, that Illinois has got this thriving, you know arcade scene and we have limped along with things like rusty quarters and and now we have up down which is great which i'm hoping sticks around um you know and seems to be thriving and you know without any competition maybe it'll be here for a while hopefully so yeah yeah we are going we are going to start uh opening the the arcade at the shop up probably two to three times a month also oh cool Ooh, tell us about that how's that going to work well, we we actually what we did is we picked up another warehouse space, and uh, our issue was kind of being overloaded with machines, and so we've carted 
probably about 60, 70 machines out of the shop. <laughs> I didn't uh, even know so you had that many machines. We, yeah, we've, we're up around 140 or 150 now. It's it's kind of uh, ridiculous, I think is a good word for it. <laughs> don't, don't let Brian fool you, Adam. 90 of those 150 are all, uh, what are those things called? Jamma? Glass cities. Oh, 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 they're candy caps. <laughs> hey, only 12 of them, only 12 of them are uh, candy cabinets. <laughs> candy cabinets, that's what I was trying yeah. to say. Candy cabs. Those are the Japanese candy cabs. Those are actually kind of cool, though. They are. I want one. God, and, I hate and we have, I want one. And we do have one of the only uh, I want one cyber so leads I can around smoke. with a PlayStation 2 port on it. So you can bring over a PlayStation 2 joystick and plug it into the cyber lead and play. Interesting. That is cool. When uh, Paradise Arcade Shop had their open house, they had quite the turnout for uh, a bunch of those fighter games. It was pretty fun to watch some of those guys. <laughs> they, they're definitely. I mean, it's they. You know, everybody teases about it being esports, but you know, those guys they have some amazing skills. Oh yeah. Uh, when you watch them play, but what we're planning on doing is getting the shop down to more of a an arcade format, redoing some lighting, getting some neon, um, and making it feel and look like an arcade. Oh, cool. Over in the one section, and the first time or first two times, we'll probably just open it up, get some pizza, and then after that, we're talking about maybe doing a, uh, a somewhat of a door charge, but nothing nothing crazy, and kind of opening it up for the night to uh, let people come over, play some games, hang out. Um, just generally have a good time, uh, with the backup warehouse, we can have kind of a back stock of games. So we should have at least 95% uh, of the games on the floor working at any time. Uh-huh. The goal is to have two projects in the shop at any time and the rest of everything there should be working. Oh, that's cool. It's a great idea. Yeah. So we'll we're out. Also, so if, if uh, anyone's interested in getting more information on that, do they just email you directly at paradise arcade shop to find out the dates and times and all that or How's that going to look? We, you know, the best way is kind of the using that social media engine and get going through Facebook. Um, it's <laughs> painful. I never thought I'd be doing much Facebook, but <laughs> it's a really easy way to let a lot of people know uh, what's going on. So we we're hoping actually the first one will be coming up in December. Um, we actually we're we're really we've been doing a lot of work in the shop. We've added a lot of uh, machines actually lately, four new pinballs and. Um, we're we're really looking forward to kind of getting it to a format where it's presentable. Uh, we've moved something like fifty or sixty monitors out. I mean, it's just it's a big transformation over the last four or five weeks, and there's been a lot of work. <laughs> Why, wow, man? Yeah. Plus, uh, considering that your daytime job, you're a doctor. <laughs> my my hobby. Details. Yeah, your hobby. Right. <laughs> I'm just saving lives in my uh, hobby, and uh, my main job is an arcade guy. That's funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, other news looks like there has been an arcade announcement of all things. Daytona USA three is coming soon. According to polygon.com. Yeah, that's really cool actually, because that's, you know, out of all the arcade games that I play in a modern, uh, setting these days, it's usually some sort of racing game. And I love the Daytona series. I don't know about you guys. I, I, for some reason, I can never get into. I, I had a hard time getting into racers. I have, okay. I've tried several times. We had a rush machine in Hawaii for a long time, and every time I sit down and play, I just can't get into it. But I'll yep. give it a shot on this new one. Well, apparently, it's very faithful to the original. Uh, Forbes has an article about it, uh, but I, I'm I'm really looking forward to it because, um, you know, well, and there, there's very there's like a. Very, there's a smattering of new games out there that I'm really interested in. Um, there's like a Queen Bee four player on four player network game that's really cool, it's kind of joust esque. And then, um, and then you kind of fall back on these racing, um, you know, network games. So, Daytona 3 has uh, has my attention. I'm uh, I'm interested in Sky Cursor, those are some guys we should try to get on this show too. That's a pretty neat project they have going on there. Oh, yeah, that'd, that'd be great. So they, uh, that what a lot of people don't realize is, uh, and I don't know if this is a spoiler for anything in the future, but sky cursors, and it's not just about the game, but, uh, the airframe system is actually a platform like the Naomi systems or, uh, the old Thomas wave system. So the system they built is a system for, uh, bringing new games to the arcade. So they have a, like an airframe console. That's a JAMA CGA output console 
And then the cartridge that goes in there, similar to like a Naomi system, is Sky Cursor. And I believe they are working on a new game right now. So, oh. so this is okay. So just for the layman in the in the um, in the audience, and that means it's basically kind of like a Neo Geo. You have that means yeah. that means Adam doesn't understand. Let's not go into greater detail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, jerkwad. <laughs> means Adam doesn't understand. I don't know what he means with this cartridge-based system. I just want to let you guys know that I had a couple of people give me some feedback that said they didn't know what the heck we were talking about from time to time, and so I'm opening it up for discussion. It's like a deco. So, kind of like a Neo Geo, right? It's a cartridge-based system, and it's standardized, so you can stick whatever game into it. And what you're talking about is a a new modern uh, game, Dan, right? Dan and... And who was our guest again? Brian, right? So, uh, nice. so explain, <laughs> explain to me, phone? <laughs> explain to me again what the game is actually about because I don't know what you're talking about actually. A sky sky cursor? cursor is just a, it's just a shoot 'em up. It's a great okay. shoot 'em up. It's a shmup, so it's like yeah. a left to right like space shooter. It's a uh, what is it? It's about like saving the world, which okay. like a lot of the good shoot 'em ups are. And like Gradius, uh, your dog. Go ahead, Dan. Like Gradius? No, I wasn't saying anything. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I. It's a. Uh, is it vertical like or R-type? side scrolling platformer? Yeah. R type would be a better. R type. Okay. Well, R type, Gradius, Life Force. Those are all very similar. The nice thing about the the fun thing they did with this one though is um, they don't have a console version. Okay. So so these guys are focused on like building arcades again. So what they're trying to do is they're oh. trying to get things back to the arcade so that people have to go to the arcade to play Sky Cursor. You can't buy it for your home. Okay. Which is kind of cool. Yeah, um, cool. Which brings up a point of when we start doing our open houses. We will actually have a sky cursor at the shop. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's epic. Yeah. And maybe on one of those candy cabs you don't like. <laughs> well, I'll suck it up and uh, sit down at one of those things and play it. <laughs> We're thinking sky cursor on a 29 inch CGA would be a lot of fun. That would okay. be a lot of fun. My God, that'd be fun. I can't and wait to see that. The battle. See? <laughs> oh, everybody's happy. So maybe we go. should. <laughs> I was just trying to end the news now. So, cause we've been talking about the news for a while. So maybe we should interview our, our esteemed guest. Ryan. Oh, I see how it is. Fine. Yeah. You know, she, he's there. Go ahead. Don't worry about me. I'll just sit back here. So we have this guest and his name is Brian McLeod of the clan McLeod Armitage, the <laughs> third. And he's a doctor on, on in real life. But on this show, he's a hobbyist. Am I on track so far, Brian? I, I don't know if you call it a hobbyist or an obsessed person or, <laughs> or what the proper name is, but it's something somewhere in the middle there. Well, uh, Dan and I welcome you to the show. You know, Thank you. You're our, technically our fourth guest because last episode we had two guests. So four is my favorite number, though. So welcome to the show. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> can you can you tell us and and Dan uh, Dan we should you know you know we should pummel him with questions because we only have a limited amount of time now. But sure, sure. Uh, but my my question my first question for you, Brian, is uh, can you tell us a little bit about Paradise Arcade and how you got into selling arcade stuff in the first place and you know uh, give us sort of a background on what you sell and how you got into it. So we, um, about seven or eight years ago, I was living over in Hawaii. The arcade scene over there is, is very poor. I mean, to give you an idea, I couldn't sell for six years. I couldn't sell my paper boy for $300. And, uh, I picked up a cabinet and decided I wanted to have lit buttons in it. And so I went looking around, fold, found the Ultimark lit buttons and decided I didn't want to pay that much for the lit buttons and then found some over in China and they had to buy like 200 of them and 200 of them worked out. I picked them up. And now I had 160 or 170 extra buttons. <laughs> so I went on KLOV, put yep. them, put an ad up for them, and literally like two days later they were gone. Nice. And I said, "Well, that's interesting." So I went out and bought 500 buttons. <laughs> <laughs> did, Why did not? Did the same thing, and in like two weeks they were gone. 
And so before all of these kind of LED based buttons that are everywhere now uh, were available in the US, I was buying them and selling them. I, we sold, I don't know, around 30 to 50,000 of those things. Um, I mean, it really was amazing how quickly they started moving and selling and our whole business started just selling those. And we learned a lot very early on about um, the Chinese vendors, the parts, what was important. Uh, we learned very quickly that a lot of the Chinese vendors, they just sell whatever's cheapest if it looks similar. And yeah. one of the things that we did is we we sell, you know, we would force our vendors to provide us what we wanted or we would move on. And so we usually have two or three suppliers and if one of them doesn't perform like we want, we move on to the next. And then usually they come back kind of begging for business. But, um, you know, so we, we started there. Um, we made a name for ourselves, I think, by understanding how to work within that system, by uh, learning quickly how to maintain quality parts coming from over there. And um, it really just kind of blossomed from there. The uh, infamous Zippy Sticks came next. Uh, we brought those over before really anybody else had them. What's uh, a Gombas Zippy boards. Stick? Well, Zippy Sticks are the – they're actually a – <laughs> I could say they're a Simitsu LS32 knockoff made in China, which won't help a lot of people. But they're basically a Chinese knockoff of a Japanese joystick. Okay. Um, but, but they're a relatively inexpensive four-way, eight-way stick. And you could, that, um, you could switch right? between four and eight. Yeah, there's a little plate that you move back and forth, so you could play either sets of games. Which is great, and because if you're like a Pac-Man fan, and you have like a 16-in-1 or a multi-game in your machine, you can take the four, and uh, you can switch it to four-way, so you can play those old four-way games, uh, and more and feel, have more of the native feel, right? And then when you want to play like a fighter, like a Street Fighter or a Mortal Kombat, you can switch it to eight-way and go that route as well. Or even something like Gunsmoke, okay. you know, where you had diagonals. Any any game that had diagonals in it, uh, you would need to have uh, the ability to have an eight-way. Sure. And, uh, you know, we, we just, it kind of grew from there. Uh, we started out in Classics. Then we got into doing some MAME. We uh, teamed up with an electronics designer and started bringing out some MAME boards for doing uh, emulation so you could read arcade controls into a computer. That's cool. And uh, after doing that for a little while and having a good time with that and a lot of success with that, we started working in the fighting game community <laughs> where we provide a lot of pro- products and parts for the uh, the new eSports and, and fighting game guys. And the oh. markets are they're interesting. They're, they're very different, but they're a lot of fun. And one of the things that we've really enjoyed is there's a lot more crossover that people don't realize. You know, People will come to the shop and say, hey, I've got a, a machine and I need to replace the joystick, but this joystick doesn't exist anymore. Sure. What can I use? And I can go over to the shelf and we have around 40 or 50 joysticks. Yeah. And I can usually hand them a joystick that H- hands is down close to what they want. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Hands down, you have the best selection of uh, modern arcade parts in the Twin Cities. So if anybody is actually listening and looking for parts right now, Brian's your guy, you know, Paradise Arcade. So um, you keep saying we, uh, you're, you and your wife started this? Yeah, well, so she, when we moved over to Hawaii, it was for residency okay. and uh, for me to do orthopedic residency. And when she moved over, she didn't have a job. And after these buttons started selling, I kind of said to her one day, so I can't do this. I have to learn how to be a surgeon. <laughs> but Details. if you want a job, here's here's a job. <laughs> <laughs> and over the last seven or eight years, she's really, um, it's actually kind of funny. She'll uh, get phone calls and she'll pick up the phone. The, the phone number list on the site is actually her personal phone. And she picks it up and somebody will say, oh, I need to talk to the technical department. And she'll <laughs> literally say, hold on a second. She'll be quiet. And then she'll say, hi, this is the technical department speaking. <laughs> Now, she's gotten quite quite good, and uh, she's pretty impressive at actually being able to help people through different problems. And she can do about 90 to 95% of the questions, and then the other ones, I get frantic text messages and voicemails and other things in the middle of the day saying, you know, how does somebody do this, and what can we do with that? <laughs> I do have to so. admit, like, <clears throat> one of the... Uh, I a, a while ago, I bought a 60-in-1 uh, board from you. I don't know if you sell them anymore, actually. But I bought a 60 in one board from you while you were out in Hawaii. And there's a couple of good connections here because I have a, uh, timeshare in Kauai. <clears throat> and so I'm, 
um, I, I go back every other year and enjoy a vacation there. But uh, as an aside to that, I was just really happy that there was this company in Hawaii selling arcade stuff. And um, when I looked you up on the web and then I called the number, it was like a Wisconsin area code. <laughs> and and I remember uh, the first time I called, I got your wife. And I was like, I'm looking for a 61 board. And at the time, I was building out... Uh, um, for a friend of mine, we were building a, a multi arcade uh, out of a Kickman Midway um, cocktail that we had sort of taken apart. And sorry to all the Kickman fans out there, but uh, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I liberated I'm, a Kickman. <laughs> so uh, I still have the control panels if anybody's interested, and they're mint. But anyway. Um, I called and I got your wife and she was super nice. And I'm like, what the heck you're in Hawaii and you have this Wisconsin phone number. And, uh, you know, so she was really cool. And I bought the 61 from you guys as, as my little tie in to, to, uh, my personal tie in to your business there, Brian. But thank um, you. So, um, I, I patronized you early on and I think I bought two boards from you actually. Um, and so how did you go from, Wisconsin to Hawaii back to Minnesota. Well, we, um, so I did residency over there and then afterwards I actually did spine fellowship back here. And, um, when we moved, when we were in Hawaii, we, we started out, um, literally in the kitchen. Then we moved to our bedroom, which wasn't the best choice of things. <laughs> um, then we ended up know. in a garage. Sounds like and, a great uh, choice to me. <laughs> you look at the walls of the bedroom and they're just lined with arcade parts. Um, <laughs> That's a turn. And then we, we moved to a, uh, a, a garage and then back here, uh, I came back here for fellowship. When we moved back here, we actually are in about a 3,500 square foot warehouse, uh, which really allowed us to do some of the things we couldn't do over there. Um, go for some of the bigger items, uh, start playing around with uh, having more machines and doing more restoration projects uh, and things like that. So it's a, uh, the the whole drive to come back here was purely driven by my my day job uh, as a surgeon but what's come out of it is a real explosion in what we've been able to offer and do in the shop that's really cool so you told us a little bit about your product line what are some of your biggest sellers journey arcade <laughs> what's a, oh what's did a, i say that i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no no go ahead brian uh, you know, it's it's interesting. It goes in cycles. Um, so around the holidays, there's usually a lot of multi-cade stuff, the iCades, a lot of people buying zippy sticks and the LED buttons that we started out uh, selling. And that really surges. The rest of the year, um, the primary sellers are actually the fighting game community is a very vibrant community. Um, well, and they're not these, afraid to modify a machine and make it a little different than it really and, truly was. And what right? does that mean? Is that street fighter people or is this purely the, uh, whatever the candy cab people? It's actually the co- guys that buy consoles. So what they do is oh. they, they buy these fight sticks, which are basically an arcade panel on a box. Tim Willsey was and, our first guest. He'd be your customer for sure. And they modify the hell out of them. I mean, they, it's like, I liken it to, and not to speak ill of it, but, uh, you know, when I was growing up, uh, people would buy Dodge Omnis and drop a ridiculous amount of money into <laughs> modding these things and making oh. them, you know, and, and that's kind of what happens with the fight sticks. And that we was do, my first car, <laughs> a 1979 Dodge Omni with an Audi block. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 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 but uh, that's been it's been kind of a rewarding thing to do that. But what's interesting has come out of that is um, we actually have a new line of uh, multi cade panels coming out where we took the Japanese layout of buttons where it's kind of more ergonomic and your fingers sit on the buttons easier. And we brought we're bringing that over to multi cade panels for cocktails and uprights. And we've taken some of the ideas. There's actually a set of joysticks made by a company called crown that's based in Korea that still use grommets on modern joysticks. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And so we've got some projects we're doing with that, but it's the crossover has been a lot of fun. Uh, it really is neat to have the classic guys come in and, you know, say, Hey, here, try this joystick and have them get excited about something that's brand new. And likewise, it's kind of fun to go to the, uh, the fighting guys and say, you know, they get all excited about some, new performance enhancing thing and you show them, Hey, they were doing this 34 years ago on, you know, here, this, this like ancient cabinet with a vector monitor. 
That's so, um, but the big sellers for us, I mean, we just, we move, move a lot of buttons, a lot of buttons. Uh, we have our own line of buttons and between that, the Sanwa, the IL, um, we go through thousands and thousands of buttons a month. That's, um, That's amazing. Susan, Susan brings in about 800 pounds of buttons and joysticks from IL every other month. What's IL? Uh, IL is Industrious Lorenzo. It's the so before HAP uh, moved production to China, IL, which is a Spanish company, produced all of the buttons and joysticks for all the U.S. games. So the American style button that everybody knows as the American style button is actually truly a Spanish button. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Just watching. So, and, and they still produce buttons over in a uh, in in uh, Spain. And uh, they they're still just as nice as they always were. So if you're funny thing is we get these restores. Um, there's some that are done online publicly, and people talk about them. And some that people do in their houses, and they they call us and they say, well, we need this and this. And they say, what are you restoring? And they'll say, oh, I'm restoring a Mortal Kombat. I'd say, well, you need buttons. Oh, no, no, I'm getting hat buttons. Don't worry, that's the original. <laughs> and we tell them that that's not the original. The hat no longer makes the same button. It's changed. IL is actually the original button. Okay. What's well, really and, cool. Uh, so yeah. Well, and H- Hap is for many of us, especially when you're like a budding collector and restoration guy. It's it, it definitely a place that we all ended up on early on. So that's interesting. So really, if you need buttons, folks, uh, Paradise Arcade in Minneapolis is where you want to go. If you right. need anything, really, Brian has everything. If you guys don't know, seriously, yeah. If we don't we don't have it, we love to have people ask us uh, if we can get it because that's one of the ways we get a lot of projects. Not just sorry products, not just products, but actual projects too. People come to us and say, "Wouldn't it be cool if you could do this?" And our answer is usually, "Well, we can do that." <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you just segued perfectly into projects. So tell us a little bit about what um, paradise arcade is doing in the community. Cause you just, uh, you and I had an offline conversation and I know you've um, posted about it recently, but uh, tell us what you're doing in the community to help out uh, the local community and, and what, what it actually benefits. Uh, are we talking about the spy hunter seats or the, the seats, so I, but more specifically, I'm thinking of the cabinet you recently built. Which the charity cabinet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like what cabinet? It's been it's been a long couple of weeks. I got about <laughs> three hours. Or so. I guess you got an hour and a half of sleep the night before last. <laughs> um, we uh, we actually did. Uh, my son's school was having a fundraiser, and uh, we donated a cabaret that we had rebranded to the Burroughs School Cabaret and uh, rebuilt it and put it up in an auction. Cool. We ended up uh, actually raising $1,155. We donated all the parts, wow. the cabinet, the labor. Um, actually, the guys in the shop all pitched in. It was I was really busy in the day job and had time to facilitate some things and do the concept, but a lot was of the wiring totally was done by Logan. Cabinet? Ben was helping to put parts in. Susan was pitching in. It was, it was really a, a team effort, and it was a lot of fun to see. Oh. Very cool. So was it a totally new cabinet or? It wasn't. We actually took a pack cabaret that had been, had everything stripped out of it to create a Rastan. (laughs) (laughs) Rastan again. You know, Rastan, I I have, I have to admit, I bought last year, last summer, uh, not, not this last summer, the summer before last, I bought, um, a Robotron cabinet that had a rest stand in it. And that was in a common conversion. So I, I don't, uh, I'm not surprised that it was in a, in a pack cabaret. Yeah. It's, we actually had three of them in pack cabarets, which was kind of interesting. Hmm. And, uh, when you get into it, it's, it, it gets really difficult to convert them back. <laughs> but, uh, well, if we, you uh, change it into something entirely different then that doesn't really matter. Right. Well, and that was, and our thinking was to produce something that would make money for uh, the school. And so, when you look at the audience that's there, it's you know people who are who kind of want an LCD. They want something to look nice. They they want something that's going to work. It's not going to need maintenance. And so, we we did that. We gave that to them. Um, what was interesting is, and for reference, if anybody not suggesting you do, you know, uh, do this to a packed cabaret, but a 19 inch uh, LCD monitor in a three to four ratio fits very well in a packed cabaret. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. Uh, f- 
For, you know, incidentally, so does an 18-inch Dell LCD. We, we, put, <laughs> we, we put that in the, in the uh, Kickman that I repurposed was for my buddy. So, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to do what you got to do, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you're doing that kind of stuff for the community. Is there anything else that you've done recently that's um, along those lines? We are, yeah, we actually donated a, uh, a set of parts and helped build a stick for a, an organization out in uh, Colorado that was raising money uh, to help pay for Thanksgiving dinners for people. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so they, they raised uh, several hundred dollars for the stick. We we donated in, uh, the parts and donated the pieces for the uh, LED control. And a friend of ours who actually builds wooden stick cases for these fighting games built the case and assembled all the parts in there. But, you know, it's it's something that we, we used to actually do a lot. Uh, and we've, we haven't done as much lately, but it, it's something we really enjoy doing where we've, uh, in the past run sales where we donate 10% of all the sales, uh, we've run events where we donate 10% of our sales to a charity. Um, we do, we definitely support a lot of the, the different charities when people come to us and say, we need money for uh, March of dimes or not money, but parts. And we want awards. Um, we really like to see those things uh, happen and it's fun to see other people in the community do those things. And when they, they come to us and ask us to help, the, the answer is almost always yes, which is, which, that's which phenomenal. Is it's good to see. That's phenomenal, dude. That's, that's a really, uh, it's good karma. It is. Yeah. Well, listen, I don't have any other questions for you, but I, I want to thank you again for being on the show. So why don't you give a shout out for um, your uh, website again and your, your Twitter and your um, Facebook accounts here, Brian. We are uh, paradisearcadeshop.com on the internet. And on Twitter, we're actually Arcade Parts. On Facebook, I believe the end is Facebook slash Paradise Arcade Shop com. Nice. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we, we love uh, hearing from new people. Uh, we always are open to ideas. In fact, Adam uh, and I are, are have something coming out for his, uh, his new cocktail table creation soon. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, we do this because we love doing it. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a statement on one of the websites. Every now and then people get a little feisty between the different stores and we made a list of the five reasons we do this and one of them is passion and we really do enjoy the hobby. Yeah. Um you know the the store is mildly profitable. It's not I'm not going to retire on it, but uh what we what we get out of it is is a real love of the, of the hobby, collecting the games and seeing other people get into it and enjoy collecting games. Since we've been in Minneapolis, we've had probably about 50 to 70 people stop by the shop who are just new collectors and it's a blast to see them come in and talk to them about uh, what they're doing and what they're trying to do. And there's almost not enough time to, to really appreciate all the people who are getting excited about arcades lately. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you invigorating the hobby and the way you do. And that's just like, it's so cool to have a shop like yours in town and, um, and I, and I, and I, and I really love working with you, like on these obscure little details, uh, for instance, on my tapper cocktail, the brass corners that are just about to come out. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that, but, um, that's the kind of thing, you know, these little, these little things that we work on together, these are the things that reinvigorate people in the hobby. And I, I just, um, that's the reason why we're in it is just to enjoy it and, you know, you know, have fun with it and have people come and talk about it really, you know, and just get together and talk about it. So I love it. Just thanks. Thanks. Thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to sign off. I've got to go do a, a late night <laughs> day job case here. Somebody's shoulder needs a little bit of help. So we're going <laughs> to, the joke yeah. that we have is that she has a titanium deficiency and we're going to go fix that by oh. putting a lot of titanium in her shoulder. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening on the show. Uh, this Thanks, new, Brian. Yeah, this is great. So thanks for listening to the Double R's. That's Arcade Radio. Please join the conversation at any time at React at Arcade Radio. That's R-C-A-D-E-R-A-D-I-O dot com. Call and leave comments and questions on the game line. That's 612-548-GAME or 4263. Or follow us on Facebook. That's Facebook com slash arcade radio uh, and at t- arcade radio on Twitter. 
Spotify. Over and out. Thanksgiving. That's what I was thinking. We should maybe say that too, like you know, a little happy Thanksgiving. You know, happy Thanksgiving. I I think you're right on. Happy hap, hap, happy Thanksgiving thank, from Arcade Radio. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for thank listening you for listening. Thank you. Oh, and if you're still listening, happy Thanksgiving. Subscribe to us on iTunes and Google Play because we're now on Google Play because we're so awesome. Eat turkey. Yeah, <laughs> turkey is good. Don't talk Eat politics. Turkey. It's delicious. Politics are dumb. Don't talk about that. Your family will just get mad. <laughs> <laughs>